In this segment, we're going to talk about neural network models for building chatbots. So our foundation starts also from the idea of treating these kind of chatbots as a machine translation problem, where the user gives us some utterance and we want to map that to our response in a sequence to sequence fashion. And so we can approach this not using a phrase-based system like we saw from some of the previous work, but uh, instead using a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, right? Uh, so we can take a, an input like, what are you doing? And, you know, we at least it seems conceivable that we should be able to train an LSTM to map this to a response like, I am going home, if we see enough data and this has the right kind of responses and everything, of course. The main challenge here, by the way, compared to the problem of machine translation, and one reason that progress in this area has been a little less linear, as we're going to see, uh, is that the evaluation is much trickier. So this, this earlier paper, the relatively early paper in this space by Sardoni et al, used blue score to evaluate. Um, and so these blue scores are out of 100. And so the human responses get a blue of six when compared against other human responses. Uh, the MT outputs get a blue of three. Now, we've talked about how blue scores can't really be interpreted in an absolute sense. And in many cases in translation, we saw scores of you know, 25, 30, 40 that we said were actually pretty good for those tasks. Regardless, the, the issue is that uh, these scores are really just kind of not connected that strongly with the quality of the chatbot, where going from you know, a blue score of three to a blue score of four with an automated system, um, is, is not likely to be correlated to improvements in how users like enjoy interacting with it or something like that. Anyway, setting that aside, we could still take this as our paradigm for training these systems. And one of the data sets that people use is this data set called open subtitles. Okay, if we need a whole bunch of data about conversations, um, we talked earlier about Twitter as a source of this, but we can also use uh, subtitles for movies and zero in on people having conversations in movies. Um, so you have things like, you know, and where had you just been before? I'd been to the Palace of the Legion of Honor, the art gallery, um, you know, reasonable response to this question. Um, do you want to meet your sponsor for the last 10 years? Of course, but he doesn't want to see me. Okay, so you, you see some reasonable dialogues here. But there's a lot of problems with training on this as data. I mean, for one thing, we're, trying to use these subtitles ungrounded in the context of the scenario that's going on. Um, and sometimes it's like a multi-party conversation and that doesn't necessarily uh, you know, get reflected well here. And so these models are training on data that's fundamentally pretty noisy because without some kind of context, we don't know where we've just been. And so generating the Palace of the Legion of Honor, the art gallery, generating something this specific is very challenging. So this task ends up having the same flavor as language modeling, where we end up with a very flat distribution over a lot of different possibilities. And that might be okay, but the issue is that it leads to non-diverse responses. Because if you ask the system a question, like we'll take a look at the bottom one here, how old are you? If you ask someone how old are you, they might say, I don't know, but very likely they'll, they'll give you some number, right? The problem is that I don't know is more likely than any one of the numbers they might give you. So they're, they're likely to give you a number. And so if we think about a kind of class-based model, that would have a higher probability. But if we're just thinking about raw probabilities of responses, I don't know is more likely than saying I'm 25. I um, mean, so you end up with these generic responses that surface to the top for all these questions that should have straightforward answers, like what is your name, what are you doing, et cetera. It always just says, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Um, that's not very interesting. So this problem has been noted up for a while. Um, so one solution from Jiwei Li et al. from Stanford uh, was to try to use the notion of mutual information. Uh, we haven't talked about this much this far in this course, but the idea is that uh, rather than just predicting the response conditioned on the utterance, you want the idea of the utterance being likely conditioned on the response. Um, so instead of just optimizing for uh, the, the kind of probability in the forward direction, um, we have the 
kind of formula for mutual information here, which is the log of the joint probability divided by the ratio of the two marginal distributions over each of the variables. And so if we simplify this, we can view this as maximizing the probability of the response given the user's utterance. Uh, and then we're penalizing that by the log probability of the response. So what this is saying is I want responses that are likely given this utterance, but unlikely a priori. And so a response like I don't know is going to have a high probability a priori. And so the second negative term is going to be high and it's going to get dispreferred. All right. And, you know, we can look at data that comes out from this and see that it works a little bit. For example, I did not get the report from the from an MI6 agent. Um, and then the system says, you did the right thing, did you? OK, this doesn't really make any sense in the context, but it avoids giving this generic response of, I don't think that's a good idea. And so, uh, you know, you see other cases here where instead of saying, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about, um, it at least gives some response, uh, you know, but obviously there's kind of significant problems here. OK, I'll mention one other uh, way to do this that uh, Wei Jen Ko and, and Jesse Lee and I have worked on, uh, which is to use notions of specificity. So there's data sets that are annotated basically with respect to how specific different utterances are. And so one way to address this is to train a classifier to determine whether a sentence is specific or not. Then during training time, we condition the generation of the output on a specificity level. And so when we're generating something like I don't know, we'll pre-decide that, okay, this is non-specific, and then feed that specificity indicator into the model during training. And what this is going to do is this is going to help factor out specificity as a variable that we can control. This is a fairly common trick in sequence to sequence models where if you have some sort of auxiliary information that tells you something about your output, that gives you a kind of control axis. And what that allows us to do then is at test time, we can change the specificity and increase it. And so when we set the specificity to four, we should be more likely to get responses that are kind of, you know, more highly specific because in the training data, when you saw specificity four in your conditioning context, you would generate something more specific. Okay, another, another kind of way around this and another one of the problems with, okay, let me start here. Another one of the problems with these systems is they fundamentally don't have anything to say, right? Especially if you train on the subtitles data, I mean, they're just kind of indexing and saying random stuff from different movies. They're not actually uh, telling, a, you know, portraying a, the, you know, the identity of the agent that's conversing with you, right? Because this thing is, a, is just an automated system that has no identity. So one idea in this persona chat uh, data set that was constructed is to instead have uh, human annotators build this data set with each human being assigned a particular persona. For example, I have an artist, I have four children, uh, I recently got a cat, etc. And then these two people are asked to have a conversation drawing on these personas. Now, based on this data, we can have the system have one of these similar personas, or the system can learn with this persona as its, its kind of context. And then by giving it a persona at test time, it should be able to you know, give responses as if it were that particular persona. OK, so this is, a, you know, this is, this is kind of one way of endowing these things with uh, a little bit more personality. Um, but the problem is that this data is still relatively modest in size. Um, I, mean, I think they have on the order of 100,000 of these conversations, which is pretty big. But when we're talking about learning to generate whole utterances and just seeing such diverse situations, I mean, machine translation, we're dealing with you know, orders of magnitude more data than this in a lot of cases. So the question is how to scale up. And so uh, naturally, the answer to this involves pre-training. And so uh, there's work from a team at Google uh, on a system called MENA that leverages pre-training for this kind of uh, dialogue generation task. Um, it's a large sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, larger than GPT-2, trained on 
uh, a large data set of conversations scraped from social media. So, I mean, this really is getting back to the idea of this, uh, you know, chatbots as translation systems. Um, and it's, you know, using publicly available data in order to do this. And the responses it gives now look a lot better. If you ask it, why do you like the ocean? I mean, we, we, we remember what these other systems might say and they might give some answer that's only kind of barely relevant. But here the system will go on and talk about these long things about, you know, the sea sounds cool and it's really satisfying to swim in, or I don't know, it's beautiful, I guess. It's really, it reflects my upbringing. You know, these things that are much more relevant, uh, much more sensible and coherent in the context of this question. Um, another system which is re relatively similar is by a team from Facebook called Blender. It, and it, uh, it, it uses the same idea of pre-training um, with some differences in the transformer architecture. Um, and, but they do a little bit more, uh, they do a little bit more work on the fine tuning side of things where they leverage this persona chat data, another data set called empathetic dialogues, and another data set called Wizard of Wikipedia, where the system is kind of talking about a concept that it sees from Wikipedia. And so the reason it's called Blender is because it's blending these different uh, data sets and also different conversational strategies. Uh, and so the responses in this case often look pretty cool. Like, for example, will you sing me a song? Uh, sure, what do you want me to sing? I can sing you a song about you know, I could sing you a song about baking. Yes, sing me a song about baking. Um, do you want me to sing it to the tune of Sing Along With Mitch? And then, you know, but then the system kind of no, no longer wants to sing the song, um, and then it kind of degenerates into sort of comedy sketch territory at the end here. Um, the model also still has some of these problems where it gives inconsistent responses. Um, and there's an interesting example on the right here about the mushroom going to the party. And it's this joke that uh, because, because he is a fung guy, um, you know, fung guy, mushroom, that's the sort of phonetic joke that it's making. And the interesting thing here is at the end, the system seems to be explaining the joke back to the user. But it probably didn't actually understand this joke. It probably saw this stuff in its pre-training data somewhere um, or you know, learned to parrot back a paraphrase of what the user was saying or something like that. Um, you know, again, we, we kind of hit the limits of these because without actual grounding in the world, without actual things to say or models of the world, there's only so much that these systems can do. They're basically statistical models trained over a whole bunch of conversation data and they're parroting more or less what would the kind of average person on the internet, as, as based on my data, what would the average person on the internet say in response to this question? So th this kind of illustrates in some ways the limitations of this, uh, of this idea where, um, you know, we, just because we can build these simulacra that can hold reasonable conversations. That doesn't mean we've solved AI. And it's not even clear necessarily what the path forward from this to a system that has really kind of deep, meaningful interactions uh, is. But regardless, it's still a very cool capability that we can generate these, um, you know, these realistic looking utterances and have long form conversations with people. Uh, it's a, you know, it's, it's a very active area of research. And so it'll be interesting to see where this goes. That's the end of this segment.